All right, good. My name is Danny Trump. I am the Chief of Staff, Business Manager, PR Marketing Lead, and Program Director for Military Families at Microsoft. That's a mouthful. Um, all you have to know is that I help run the Military Affairs team at Microsoft. And today I'm going to share a couple stories with you. I'm going to share a couple programs that Microsoft runs that you may not think that Microsoft runs. So typically, if you think of Microsoft, what do you think of? Anybody? Windows. Windows. What else? What's that? Office. Skype. Which teams? Xbox. Very good. All right. We've got a very knowledgeable crew here. Um, but nobody said military affairs. So today, and that's okay. That's okay. We're a very small team. But I'm going to share with you some of the things that we do at Microsoft Military Affairs. This is us. Starting from your left, that is my boss, Chris Cortez, who is a 33-year Marine Corps veteran, Major General, served 33 years. Uh, he is the Vice President of Military Affairs, and I act as his Chief of Staff. I'm also a mar uh, Marine veteran, 21 years in the Marine Corps. Then we've got Carol Headley, who is a child of a military family, and she runs the operations piece for our MSSA program, which I'll get into in a couple minutes. Joe Wallace, another Marine with over 20 years of service in the Marine Corps as well, so we're very Marine heavy, almost 80 years of Marine Corps service right here. And then Thomas Dawkins, who uh, creates all our curriculum for our programs. All right, uh, some of the ground rules. As we move along, please feel free to just shout out any questions, any comments. If you have anything to say, just shout it out. This is, we're all adults here, so you don't have to raise your hand or anything like that. Cool? All right. I want this interactive. All right, that's our mission statement. You gotta start with the mission statement, right? It's to inspire the lives, inspire veterans, inspire the veteran community so that we can help them enter the digital economy. How many know what is the most pressing issue in America today? What is the most pressing issue? Privacy, Privacy okay, what else? I'm sorry? Income inequality. income inequality, you're very close to what I'm trying to get at. And speaking of income inequality, one of the key talking points that Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella always talks about, and as a part of the program that we run, is the idea of economic inclusivity. So when we talk about diversity and inclusivity, we're not just talking about skin color, we're not just talking about gender, we're also talking about economic classes, so thank you for that. What I'm trying to get at here is that one of the most pressing issues that we're gonna be facing in the next 10 to 20 years is the reskilling of America, America's workforce. And what we're looking at is, how many of you seen Tesla's new self-driving trucks? They have trailer tractors that can run from point A to point B through traffic, diverging traffic, um, avoiding cars and people and dogs and pets all on its own. So what is that going to do? That is going to displace millions of truck drivers that are depending on that kind of work. And when you take that 45 year old truck driver who has driven a truck all his life and dismantled his entire work as he understands it, how are we going to get that population into the digital age? And that's what we're doing here. We're taking a small step forward, but we're beginning with the veteran workforce. All right. So why are we doing this? I think I just explained that. That's me back in 2010. As I said, I retired from the Marine Corps. That's my wife, my son, my two daughters who are 26, 22, and 18 now. And I can proudly say that I am an empty nester as of this summer when my son goes off to college, and I am very excited about that. But back in 2010, when I retired from the Marine Corps, this is what the job landscape looked like. You ever see that movie scene where the mobster gets out of jail after serving 20 years, the little paper sack, He's got about $12 in his pocket. The gate hits him in the rear as he comes out of jail. It's a dirt road, and there's one taxi cab down the road, and there's nothing else except the tumbleweed just going down the road. That's what the job market looked like. 
unemployment rate for veterans was in the mid 20% range. Mid 20% range. America's economy was in its worst situation since the Great Depression back in 2008. And me, like a knucklehead, decides to leave the most secure job in the world. But I was fortunate. I was able to bounce around and eventually land at Microsoft. That's another story for another day. So what we're endeavoring to do is take the veteran workforce that is leaving the military on an annual basis. There is a quarter million service members who leave the military on an annual basis. 250,000 service members looking for jobs. And at the height of the recession, what was happening was for every army soldier that left the army and was unable to get a job and went on unemployment, the army had to pay for the unemployment cost. For Marines, the Marine Corps had to pay. The Navy, the Navy had to pay and so on and so forth. So what we did was we worked with Congress to pass the VOW Act, which essentially said that during the last six months of a service member's uh, obligated time in the military, that service member can elect to take a career skills program. And a career skills program like Microsoft Software Systems Academy, and I'll get into more details about that. So that's how we address the veteran workforce. We also looked at the military spouse workforce, which I'll get into later, which was facing even twice the unemployment rate of the veteran workforce. And then when you consider those that were employed, over half of them were underemployed. And then you may be wondering, military child? No, this is not a youth camp to get kids into the military. What do we mean by that are that those are children of military families. As I showed you, I have three kids who I dragged all over the world, and my two daughters are still upset at me because one, I decided to give a Veterans Day speech at her high school in uniform, and I scared every boy away from her. The second reason is that I moved both of my girls right in the middle of their high school to a new high school. And if you think about your high school years, if you think about your middle school years, and you think about that, that day that you walked into that school not knowing anybody around you, and the anxiety that, and the stress that that caused, Multiply that by six to nine times for children of military families. Six to nine moves during an educational career is what most children of military families face. So we'll look at programs that we've been developing for that. All right. So YouthSpark is, we'll start with the children. YouthSpark is a one-day STEM activity camp that we, uh, that we created. Back in 2012, it was for civilian schools, middle schools. And it wasn't until two years ago that we decided to start doing this on military installations. Now, for those of you who are not affiliated with military, yes, we have public schools that reside on military installations, and we have children and family members of military families that go to these schools. And these camps are out of their reach. So what we decided to do is take the camp to them. And I've got a short video I'd like to show. So that's an example of our Joint Base San Antonio. We pulled together three middle schools. There were about 180 students there. And um, yeah, let me show you the video. <coughs> if only we had somebody from Microsoft to help with the technology. <laughs> it was working 20 minutes ago, wasn't it? Yes, it was. All right, we'll, we'll skip that. Basically, what we do is we bring a camp to them. We teach them. We, teach, uh, we bring them into a general session and then we break them off into smaller sessions. We teach them everything from drone technology. We give them scotch tape, copper wires, and a website. And we put them into little teams and we say, create this prosthetic hand and test it on this unit. We show them how sharks swim, the idea of pitch, roll, yaw. 
And we also put them together with mentorship classes so that employees from Microsoft will come down and speak with them and talk about what an education, what a career in STEM looks like. Because right now, people of color, and especially women, are underrepresented in the tech sector. So that's one of the things that we're endeavoring to do. All right, let's talk about MSSA. That's the core of the programs that we run. Microsoft Software Systems Academy, we started this about five years ago. Again, 250,000 transitioning service members. During the last six months of their service, we ask them if they're leaving the military. If they are, their commanders can authorize them to take this academy. We not only provide them the technical training, but we also provide them the corporate skills. We teach them how to dress, how to write their resume, how to interview, how to negotiate your salary, how to onboard onto a company. We also connect them with mentors from Microsoft who are veterans so that on a weekly basis they can check in and they can check in on each other and make sure that the student's uh, progressing along and is scheduled for uh, success and graduation. If that candidate decides to join Microsoft, what we then do is continue that mentorship relation for the next 12 months as he or she onboards at Microsoft. I don't know if any, any of you know this, but 66% of veterans leave their first job within the first year. Retention for veterans is horrible. And it's not the veteran's fault. It's just that the two worlds are very different. And to onboard them and to make that transition is more difficult than you may think. So by having that mentor, what we have found is that retention has skyrocketed from 33% to over 90%. We teach them one of four learning paths, cloud application development, the second one you can't see as well, I'm sorry, uh, server and cloud administration, database and business intelligence, and cybersecurity. We're also looking at artificial intelligence and machine learning in the next couple of years. Why did we choose these learning paths? Because the Bureau of Labor Statistics has indicated that there's gonna be the most growth, the largest growth in these career fields. When they do get hired, when they do get hired, we're not looking to put them behind a cash register. I don't want them serving coffee. I don't want them moving boxes. I don't want them working the midnight shift, making minimum wage. What we're talking about are meaningful careers. Meaningful careers meaning there's career progression. If you work hard, you can get promoted, you can get merit pay increases, and you can move on with that career and you can build a career out of this. Couple of examples of where our students have landed. As you can see, some of our biggest competitors are on here, and we don't charge a dime for this program. Amazon Web Services is our number one competitor in the cloud market right now. Yet, we build and invest in a program that builds their pipeline of talent at no cost to them. Why do we do this? Because the veteran community is at the focal, focal point of this program. It is not a business. Some statistics regarding the program. Oh, well over 90% graduate. Well over 90% are employed. We have approximately 500 hiring partners. 500 hiring partners. So out of all the graduates, Microsoft only hires 25%. 75% go to our hiring partners. HP, Google, Dell, Amazon, etc. Starting average salary is about $75,000. If you look at places like New York, Los Angeles, or Seattle, you're talking about $95,000. And by the way, um, for a corporal and E4 in the military, that is two or three times that person's salary. So this is life impacting. And we run this program at 15 different locations. As of May 30th, we're gonna add on the 15th location down in Hawaii. So the closest one to here is right down the road, Fort Carson, Colorado Springs. Those are some of the roles that we've hired for. As you can see, it's not, it doesn't just feed into one role, but it can feed into a multitude of roles. All right, I think that's it for MSSA. Let me, let's see if this video works. So before you move on? Yes. So you've just given us a list of first jobs? Yes. What are second jobs? I don't know. I don't know. So uh, what I mean by career progression is within those fields, they would progress. 
So I'll give you a good example. Uh, there was an Army soldier. Her name is Ryan Makababa. She was one of our first uh, candidates through the Joint Base Lewis McCord. She was, um, I forget what her MOS was, her military occupational specialty, but she had no technical background. By the way, you don't have to have a technical background to get into this program. We've got truck drivers, pilots, we've got wrench turners, and we've got communications and every other field you can imagine. And when she went through this program, she was hired onto Microsoft immediately for an Azure authentication. So cloud authentication. She's, she, she was recognized by Michelle Obama, in fact, at the White House in the Roosevelt Room. And uh, when Michelle Obama asked her what she likes to do, she said, I like to take long walks on, along the beach during sunsets and think about the different ways I can authenticate Azure. That's the kind of mindset this lady has, very smart. Uh, just recently, she transferred over to cybersecurity. Now she's helping us uh, with the cybersecurity uh, department. So that's what I mean by different careers. Does that answer your question? Thank you. All right, let's give this a shot. Nope. All right, let's move along. This is Andrew Richardson. He's another employee that Microsoft hired not too long ago. He was actually a bartender after leaving the Marine Corps in Spokane, Washington. Uh, didn't really have much direction in his life, uh, didn't know what he was doing, and then one day a person from our team happened to be visiting Spokane with his wife, went to a bar, sat down, Andrew served them a drink, they started talking because they were both veterans, gave him a business card. A Couple weeks later he called down to the Camp Pendleton, Southern California location, found out that a class was starting in two weeks, quit his job that very moment, packed his bags, drove down to Southern California, enrolled in the class, and now he's working at Microsoft. Amazing story. By the way, these videos are all on YouTube if you want to look it up later. I'm happy to show, uh, provide you the links. But one of the things I like about what Andrew says is that um, people are afraid of Marines. Do I have any Marines here? Sure. Hurrah. So you know what I mean, right? People are afraid of Marines. When you think about a Marine, you think tough guy, scary. And one of the things that I, what I like about what Andrew says is people are afraid of Marines, but Marines are afraid of civilians. Marines are afraid of becoming a civilian. And that's true. And I think, that, I think that's true for all service members. When you're wearing the uniform day in and day out, when you know clearly what your objective is, what your job is, when you live, breathe, and eat that job, and then all of a sudden you're expected to go into the civilian world, and it's this new world where the rules are different. The clothing is different. The people are different. It's a different language. It's scary. And that's what I like about what Andrew says. I'm sorry these videos aren't working. All right, let's talk about military spouses. This is uh, what I like to talk about most. Why are we looking at military spouses? Because 30% of military spouses are unemployed. 30% of military spouses who are looking for jobs are unemployed. The 70% that are employed, over 50% of them are underemployed. So what does that mean? That means somebody, Mrs. Smith, who is a military spouse, has a master's degree in cybersecurity, has work experience in the corporate sector, yet no one's willing to hire her. Why do you suppose nobody's willing to hire a military spouse? We have to move. It has an expiration date. It has an expiration date. They have to move. Because as soon as you present me with your resume, and if I'm the recruiter, I look at your resume, I go, man, this is great, 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 great. You're a military spouse? That means you're gonna move in two to three years because typically members of the military get orders, permanent change of station orders every two to three years. So if you're gonna leave in two to three years, why would I invest in you to come work at my company? That's one of the primary reasons. The other reason is that after you've been a military spouse for 10, 20 years, what typically happens is that every location doesn't have jobs that match your skill set. Or 
Or another good example is military spouses who have law degrees, who pass the bar in, let's say, New York, the state of New York, and they get orders to Colorado. They can't practice law in the state of Colorado. There's no reciprocity. And we're working on that right now. But that also applies for nurses. That also applies for school teachers. I mean, that, that, uh, dentists, dental hygienists, orthodontic technicians. I mean, my wife could have had a very good lucrative career in the dental field had I not dragged her from state to state. And she was getting her residency, she was getting her certifications, and then right as she was hitting her stride, I'd pull up the papers and go, we're moving. And she said, forget it, I'm not doing this. This is too hard. So what happens? After 10 to 20 years, a military spouse's resume looks like she's, a, she's wanted by the FBI. Because you worked at Carl's Jr. over here, serving fast food, then you were a medical technician, then you were a substitute school teacher, then you were a bus driver. Corporate recruiters are looking at that resume going, what in the world, where, where did you come from? So they don't understand. And that's, what, that's another reason why military spouses find, find it so difficult to get a job. Now, what is the percentage of American households that have dual income today? The answer is the vast majority. The vast majority of American households are dual income today. Yet military families are struggling. And for those of you who don't know, the military pay, um, it's good, but it's not great. It's not great. So when you take a family of let's say four or five who serve in the military, who have to move every two to three years, who have to get their furniture broken every two to three years when the moving company comes and breaks all the dishes and breaks all their furniture. And then you got to live on base housing that is really not that great. You're talking about a tough life, a very tough life. So the quality of life comes into play. And guess what happens? Anybody ever heard of, and this is a little bit, this is slightly sexist, but happy wife, happy wife, happy life. It should be happy spouse, happy life. Have anybody hear of that? Yeah, we've heard that, right? If your spouse is happy, your life is happy. Well, military spouses' lives are not that great right now. They're struggling. And when quality of life diminishes, what Blue Star Families has discovered, and that's an organization that, that does a lot of research on military families, what they've discovered is that year over year, fewer and fewer military families are inclined to stay in the military. Now, the last time I checked, our military is all volunteer. And if fewer and fewer families are deciding to stay in the military, one, you're losing a lot of good talent. But two, at a certain point, you reach that critical point where the military is, becomes ineffective. And if that happens, this becomes a national security issue. This is a national security issue. Because unless we can increase the quality of life for our military families, unless we give equal opportunity for military spouses to get employed, our military is in danger. So what are we doing about it? All right, this is the last try with the video. I promise I'm not gonna try it. This is a horrible still of her. Yeah, it's not working. Let's leave it here. Um, so last September, we, what we did was we, des we designed a pilot, pilot program and we put 19 military spouses through the Military Spouse Technology Academy run right outside of Joint Base Lewis-McChord in Tacoma, Washington. All 19 successfully graduated on March 1st and we are now in the hiring mode. We've got four or five of them hired, and we're working to get more of them hired. One got hired at Boeing, one's at Amazon, another is at Microsoft, uh, two are at Microsoft, and we anticipate another two coming to Microsoft in addition. So we're slowly getting them hired. And, and today is April 24th. So in about two weeks, I'm going to be flying down to San Antonio to make an announcement, and you guys are going to hear it first here. 
um, we're going to expand this program. We're going to continue the program in Lakewood, and we're going to expand it to the San Antonio area. Because what we're trying to do is we're trying to develop a network of jobs throughout the United States so that when Mrs. Smith goes from Seattle, Washington, and works at Microsoft for two and a half years, and if her husband gets orders to San Antonio, that I can do a warm handoff with companies like USAA or Rackspace or a number of other companies that are in the greater San Antonio area and say, hey, guess what? I've got a great candidate for you. Mrs. Smith did a wonderful job at Microsoft. How would you like to give her an interview here? And if we can continue the military spouse career progression that way, we're going to make a big, di um, sorry, we're going to make a big dent in that unemployment rate. So those are the three programs that we run. Microsoft Software Systems Academy, YouthSpark, and MSTA, Military Spouse Technology Academy. And we do it all because of those reasons. That's why we do this. That's why Microsoft invests well over $10 million a year into these programs and other programs on an annual basis. Not only for our company, not only for Microsoft, but, because, but for the veteran community. With that, I'll open it up to questions. So, how much per year does Microsoft invest in the the, the last one you described? Millions. Well over. Sir. How can you train the people who are not How can you train people who are not young with new technology? How do you train an old dog with, for new tricks? Is basically what you're saying. <laughs> but that addresses the exact uh, scenario that I described in the beginning. That the scenario of that 45 year old who's been driving trucks all his life and then all of a sudden you got his whole industry is diminished. So now you've got to teach this guy how to get into the digital economy. How do you do that? What we're proving today by taking all service members through our program, whether you're an electrician or whether you're a plumber or a truck driver, and we're giving them opportunities to get careers in tech, proves the fact that you don't need a background in technology to be successful in technology. That's what we're doing. It's a microcosm of the whole reskilling effort that I think is, we'll, we'll, we will be facing as a big national security issue in the upcoming decade. Yes, sir. So for all the veterans in here who are going to be graduating with degrees and stuff like that, um, where would like, uh, a lot of us that do something like this, would you ask us to come in and help each veteran, or, or I guess if I'm kind of, you know, that jump between the veterans who are here Yeah, so first of all, good question. Um, first of all, kudos to you for, for all the veterans who are pursuing their degree. Um, I'm putting my third kid through an undergrad program down at Occidental right now, and it's costing me a fortune. Um, despite the fact that tech companies nowadays are saying that you don't need an undergraduate degree. I know that's blasphemy in the hallowed halls of CU here, but that's what they are saying. Now, I will tell you that if you want your career to progress, if you want to get into the management roles, you will need a degree. They will look at your bachelor's, whether you have a bachelor's, whether you have a master's, whether you have an advanced degree, because they're looking for those advanced degrees in the management roles. To get into the company, Google and Facebook are both on record saying we don't need you to have an undergraduate degree. All we need is that you prove your worth in terms of how you code, um, your, your technology skills, and you know, we'll let you in the door. But if you want to continue to climb the ranks, you're going to need a degree eventually. That's my opinion. For the veterans here, as it relates to the MSSA program, the MSSA program is primarily for transitioning service members, like I said, those who are leaving the military. But we do, on a space available basis, make it open for veterans who choose to be a part of that program. So the option is open for you.
Yeah, so we run the program twice a year. They're 18 weeks, 18 week programs. And they generally start, let's see, um, most of our programs begin in October, end in February or March. And then we take about a month or two break and then start up again in July. So October and July, I think, are the two start dates. But I'm thinking um, uh, like uh, from uh, separation, it's like, hey, like you've been out for five years now. I'm sorry, I'm not accepting. No, if you're, if you're an honorably discharged veteran of the U.S. military, you can join. Okay. Yeah, you are eligible. Yes, sir. There you go, military.microsoft.com. Click on programs, you'll be able to see the MSSA link for, mil uh, for veterans and transitioning service members. And soon we'll have the MSTA link up there for once I make the announcement for military spouses. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I, I am. Um, the question is, is Microsoft expanding this program to non-military, non-veterans who are out there uh, looking for similar programs? The answer is yes. I am not an expert in everything that Microsoft does. We've got 200,000 employees who are running 200,000 different initiatives. I do know that we have other initiatives um, like uh, Tech City, uh, where we're trying, we're going and testing um, the revitalization and reskilling of workforces in six different cities right now. And if that works, we're gonna broaden that effort. Um, I can tell you, like I said, be, uh, as I started this presentation, that the entire premise behind this is to see if we can do the reskilling of the workforce. And we're proving that it is successful over the 90% employment rate that you saw up there over the last five years. Um, so there are other initiatives out there geared towards specific groups um, we have university programs, we have programs specifically for, um, I'll just leave it as we've got lots of programs that are being tested right now. Yeah. Yes, sir. How does the prioritization for transitioning service members apply to garden service? How does the prioritization work as it relates to reserve and national guard? Reserve, remember that first slide with the different squares up there? No, I got your lady. All right, I, I had a slide up here that, it, that, that showed the different boxes of different priorities with the different programs. And um, that last box, up until that planning box at the bottom, up until about a couple of weeks ago, had Reserve and National Guard in there. Because Reserve and National Guard unemployment is at about 19% across the United States. That's another population that we need to look at. It's been very difficult. I'll be very honest with you. It's been very difficult because they don't have the geographic um, flexibility. They want to be in that location. And the vast majority, well, I don't know if it's the vast majority, but a lot of them are in very remote areas. So it's presenting itself to be quite a challenge. Uh, we're, we are still looking at them and trying to figure out how to, how to solve for this. Thank you. Yes, sir. So let me ask you to broaden a bit. Microsoft hires 200,000 folks or have. And you've mentioned machine learning, you've mentioned AI. Can you give us a sense of part of the vision that Microsoft sees emerging in those two areas? Because the kids, the students who are here now, they want to participate in parts of that future as well. Sure. Um, so just to be clear, 200,000 is approximately the number of full-time and contract employees that Microsoft employs around the world. That's not how many we've hired. We've hired 1,500, 1,400 student, uh, 1,400 um, MSSA graduates. Um, it's not a big number, but we believe that we're making progress one veteran, one military spouse at a time. As it relates to your question regarding artificial intelligence and machine learning, um, you saw the four different learning paths that I had up here. 
and they did not include artificial intelligence nor machine learning. Right at the bottom there. And that's because that's, this, this program is only four and a half, five years old right now. And as we look to the future, we're finding that AI and ML, machine learning and artificial intelligence, are gonna be, are gonna soak up about 30% of the workforce in the next 10 years. 30% of the workforce. Um, I just wanted to add to Jim's question, maybe. Yep. Uh, we have a lot of our students who aren't veterans. And we're trying to see different pathways if we can get them involved. Uh, some of the things that they can do to be, you know, what is the, the most advantageous route that they can take to get involved with some of these new programs and some of the new things they should be looking at so they can start looking at future classes, different types of internships. What can they do to best get them a chance to be part of you know, the AI and everything they're seeing? Um, uh, uh, my track service showed me this huge contract they have with this ultra night vision. What's that called, Mike? The what do you go? I that. You know the. So it's the next gen yeah. night vision. You have like glasses and stuff. So how can our students, our veterans, or military, start getting you know tunnel themselves into Microsoft? What can they do? How can we help them? Yeah, I, I think that's a fantastic question, and I'll address it on a more broader scale from a tech industry perspective. When you look at companies like Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook, Google, they all have very, very robust university recruiting programs, uh, internship programs that you can, take, you can take part in, and they pay really well. Um, Microsoft, being the 45-year-old company that it is, is on the lower end of that spectrum. I'll be very transparent with you in terms of pay overall, but for interns, um, when you're making seventy-five, eighty-five, ninety thousand dollars as an intern, um, that's not a bad deal. And we've got, yeah, I know. And you're not serving coffee, or you're not making copies. Uh, you're actually doing real work. Um, Rex was kind enough to show me some of the maker labs around here, and I was telling him that at Microsoft we have similar labs all over campus in the Redmond campus called garages, where you can just walk in and you can just take materials. Um, you've got 3D printers that you can use and uh, you can build things, you can innovate, you can hack. But for university students, I would recommend looking at university <laughs> recruiting pipelines. And it's not just Microsoft again, it's all tech companies. Yes, yeah, so real quick. My name's Adam Roby. I'm a Microsoft employee as well. I'm a Colorado Air National Guard guy too, so I'm from Colorado Springs. For you students that are out there, both undergraduate and graduate, our program is called Microsoft Aspire Experience. So that's where we bring in the interns that Dave's talking about. So it's both in school, like interns, as well as graduate student interns. And I've worked with the graduate student side, so I can speak to it. It's a great program if you're interested in it. I'm sure you guys are all high speed, low drag, and getting offers from everywhere under the sun. But it's a great program at Microsoft, and it's humbling to be part of an interview process for that. I got to participate one a few months ago. And the students that are coming through there, for this is for undergraduate interns, were just blew me out of the wet water. I couldn't imagine even getting a job myself that's so accomplished and capable of intelligence. So keep doing what you're doing. Look into Microsoft Aspire's experience if you're interested in it. Aspire. 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 And yes, I would take classes all day long in artificial intelligence because to me that's the, you know, where cloud was five years ago, yeah. all the, the rave, right? That's AI is where we're going, going forward. So the more skill set you build in that, I think the more competitive you'll be to get a great job. You know, I was having a conversation with a young lady named Nikki who was going through um, getting her CS degree in some area, and she was telling me that she was also um, getting a business minor or something to that effect, and I told her, and you and I had that conversation earlier today, that when you talk about artificial intelligence, one of the things that we talk about at Microsoft is um, the ethics for AI. How do we, how do we implement um, artificial intelligence with ethics in mind? And it's in my personal opinion that unless you have the humanities, unless you have the um, philosophy classes and the history classes and the sociology classes, that you can't implement, you cannot implement AI ethically. And what I'm telling you is that as we look forward to the proliferation of AI, we're not just looking at AI in terms of can you code, but we're looking at AI in terms of can you code as a human being with ethical values. So I think having other minors um, is a, your, to your advantage. Yes, sir? So within that concept, are there any 
opportunities available for um, the legal profession or people that are getting a law degree going forward to doing this program or the program that you're talking about, sir? Legal profession? I'm not familiar with any programs for the legal profession. I don't think it would be, um, I'm not, so at Microsoft, our legal team is called SELA, and I don't remember what that starts with, but. Corporate external legal affairs. Legal affairs. Yeah, so Something that would like range from, I'm a field services guy, so consulting and support. So, you know, I've got, I work hand in hand with, a, he's a, an attorney, but he's not serving in that capacity at Microsoft, but he looks at all our contracts and can negotiate terms and conditions and all. So I would say, I wouldn't let, if you're, you know, aspiring attorney, don't let it slow you down. Look into Aspire experience anyways, and then they would channel you towards something with CELA or you know, something where you would review contracts and help negotiate um, and land big services or software sales deals. Yes, sir. Great work. Really great talk. Uh, on the question of, you know, can you move it beyond the military, one of the things a lot of the students here might be thinking about the uh, Atlantic article that we read about trying to rev up the gig economy in Arkansas. A company called Samsource came in and it was going to, you know, basically train all these folks to be able to get in the gig economy. And it's a really sad article, really well done, because it ended up not working. But there are, they're hitting an area that's high employment. Part of the reason are the like, schools and stuff, folks that want to get trained and don't try at a particular level of community. So, you know, they, they don't, their literacy is very low. Mm -hmm. The military is great. So you get folks coming in that are going to be able to hit that. So the challenge for, for Microsoft would be great to figure out how to scale it down, but maybe get some of the you know, training and that to get folks up to the bar where they It's, um, yeah, it's interesting that the people who tend to be more hourly and are making the lower end of the wage um, spectrum have a very limited opportunity for growth. They're, they're really stuck there. Um, whereas those who are a little bit more middle ground to advance have flexibility to move up, but they're already kind of well off. It's ironic. Yeah. We can only solve one problem at a time. Yeah. So um, let's end it on a really positive note. Um, that 27% unemployment rate for the veteran community back in 2010, today is sitting at 3.7%. It is l lower than the civilian unemployment rate, which is, which is sitting, I think, at 3.9%. So not only does that improve the quality of life of the veteran families, but it also increases our national security and um, it's great for the economy. So, barring any last questions? All right, appreciate your time, appreciate your attention, thank you. Hey, before you guys all take off, so I was just talking with Adam, and you guys should all be on Handshake, are you not? Yes, no, maybe so? So, be tracking Microsoft on Handshake. Of course, follow them on LinkedIn, follow them uh, on all the different social media platforms. But uh, between the two of us, we're gonna find out who the campus recruiter is. Because I know from first experience helping uh, veterans and do the stuff I do with the Pentagon, we, we don't have a great, we, we just haven't seen that much recruiting here for Microsoft. But I know they're growing, there's some great programs and my personal connections and the great, you know, they flew out here, you know, you flew in last night just to come uh, to, you know, speak to you guys, to meet some of our veteran students, to meet some of our faculty over at TCP. And the one thing that should be rudimentary is that access to a campus recruiter. They're there. Maybe they're just not on their radar, but we'll make sure they're on their radar and be able to give you guys personal connections. And we're, we're here for your success. We're here to make sure that you not just learn something great, but we want to make sure you get a good job on the backside. And you guys have a phenomenal uh, career service department. 
here at C Bowler, right there in the main engineering center or at the C4C. So I'll make sure we get you that. So uh, keep bugging myself or Dr. Curry or uh, uh, Dan Massey or any one of us. So um, it's a tradition to offer a guest, a special guest, a, a challenge coin. And so I wanted to uh, present ours to Danny. And uh, this is from the uh, University of Colorado Boulder. And uh, thank you so much for coming out here and supporting us. Thank you. And uh, Amanda already gave this gift bag. Uh, so uh, thank you for that, Jim. I appreciate it. So uh, we'll be hanging out here for a while. And uh, I know you got to head back. You're going to wait for the traffic. Yeah, so uh, local person, Microsoft. Danny is going to be here for a little bit. I'll be here hanging out. And the rest of you guys, you guys have a great day. Thanks.